my happy privilege to present unto you Pastor David Rutledge, who's going to be ministering to us in word, and his wife's going to be ministering to us in song in just a little while, and we're just going to let God have his way in this part of the service also. Amen. Um, you know, I was with the pastor a few minutes this afternoon after everybody was gone today, and and uh, not to knock anyone or in the builder of this sanctuary, but it's just not a very impressive building after all of you are gone. It's just a large, cold, empty room. And there's nothing impressive about uh, the way this is decorated, even though this is the house of the Lord and, and is his house. What makes it impressive and what makes it beautiful is your spirit here and the blessings of you here. That's what makes it his body and his church, and, and that's what brings life into these four walls. Hallelujah. You are the church. You are the temple of the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. There are basically three analogies in Scripture that talk about our relationship to the Father. And I want to talk about one of these tonight. But the three analogies are God is our Father and we are His sons and daughters through Jesus Christ. And another analogy that the Scripture talks about that we have a relationship to God is it talks about in the New Testament, in the book of Revelation, that we are the bride of Christ and Jesus Christ is the bridegroom and like in the Old Testament culture of a Jewish wedding, one day the groom is going to come for his bride and take us to be with him and have the marriage supper of the Lamb there. A literal marriage of us to the groom. And a third analogy is found in Psalms 23 and I want you to turn there with me. Why don't we stand together and let's read this aloud together. You just read it, whatever version you got. I'll be reading in King Jim here. Let's look at verse 1 and begin together. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your word. And right now, in Jesus' name, I just ask your anointing upon it. For, Father, it's your word that goes forth that touches people's lives and brings change. Change to more conform us to the image of your Son, Jesus Christ, which is our purpose for gathering here. And, God, we give this next few moments to your word and to learning your word and learning our relationship with you as our shepherd and as our guide and father as our comfort. And Lord, we just look to your word now as your sheep asking for instructions, asking for guidance, asking for comfort. And God, right now, make this word alive to us. Make this word real to us by the Holy Spirit. For Father, Lord, there's nothing in my personality or my charisma, Father, that will make this word alive, but your Holy Spirit can plant it in hearts that bring about change in, in lives. And I ask that you do that, Holy Spirit as you promised you would, that you would teach us all truth. Now teach us, Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name. And Father, we just praise you and thank you for the outcome of it. In Jesus' name, amen. Why don't you hug about six people before you sit down? <laughs>
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. All right, that's good enough. Don't get carried away. I want to preach. Every time you ask teenagers to do that, you always see the guys run over to the girls and the girls run over to the guys. Some sister over there been wanting to minister to the whole service and they get a chance. Psalms 23. Now, the, in this psalm, there are many, many benefits that it talks about that are ours as being the sheep of God's sheepfold. And you know, it's a psalm that we've all, as I stood and watched you, we recite, most of us recited it, it's a psalm that we all learn maybe in VBS, Vacation Bible School, yes, those glorious days in the summer, or in, or in Sunday school, and we got a little star beside our name for memorizing all six verses of Psalms 23. And it's a psalm that we learned way back then. And, and we kind of put it back in then, and it's kind of kid stuff. It's a childhood memory, and that's all it is to us. And we kind of relegate it to that childhood era when we memorized it way back then. But... It wasn't until I really began to study Psalms 23 as an, as an adult that I was able to reap from it everything that's, that's there that it talks about me and my relationship to my shepherd. And I couldn't understand all that as a child, even though I had it memorized, even though I got that little star beside my name that I memorized it. I couldn't reap from all that was there because I was a child and had the mind of a child. But now, growing in the Word and growing in the Lord and growing in maturity, I'm able to look to it now and receive so much more from it. And so I think it'd do us good to kind of put aside childhood memories for a few minutes and really look to this as a word from the Lord and take you to that, to our life. And to, to really get a, great, a, a good understanding of what is all that's here and talking about our relationship as God's sheep and He is our shepherd, we must begin to understand what goes on in the shepherd's mind when he says these words. We must find out what shepherds think like. We must find out what shepherds are talking about. We know that uh, the psalmist David was a shepherd boy when he wrote this, and we must understand what he was thinking about and what he had in mind so that we can really get a grasp and understanding of what, how much God really loves us and all that is here for us because there is much comfort in these passages. There is much instruction in these passages. Uh, sermons could be uh, so rich in these few verses. Sermons could be written just on these six verses. And I'll try to put it all together tonight, but I think we need to stop relegating it to a childhood era and turn to it right now and see what the Lord would say to us. Can you say amen? Hallelujah. Let's talk about sheep and shepherds. Shepherds were a nomadic people who moved and migrated. Their sole reason for being or existence was to provide for their sheep. And they migrated with their sheep from pasture to pasture to pasture. And the pasture wasn't, pasture lands weren't that great in Palestine, and so they had to do a lot of moving with their sheep. And so uh, their existence depended upon the sheep finding pasture because you see the shepherd in turn lived off the sheep's wool and the price that it would bring at the marketplace. And so they coexisted together. The sheep provided the wool for his needs and the shepherd provided pasture for the sheep's needs. And so they coexisted. Another thing about <laughs> sheep and shepherd is, um, is when I look out into a, into a pasture of cows I see cows, meaning to say, when you look out into a pasture of sheep, you just see a bunch of sheep, just like me. But shepherds had a relationship so much so with their sheep that in a flock of a hundred, as many as a hundred sheep, they would have a name for each one of their sheep. Now again, I would look out and just see a whole bunch of sheep. Well, there's a, there's a flock of sheep. But the shepherd would look out and see individual sheep and would be able to call them out by name. Another thing, uh, <coughs> the shepherd never beat their sheep and drove them. Like we see on westerns they do with the, the cowboys do with the cows. They never drove them, they always led the sheep. And another idea here is that uh, they had a very unique way of disciplining the sheep. That in those days there were no fences. And so whenever a shepherd was taking his sheep through an agricultural area, where there were fields and crops, there was only a very small path, maybe as wide as this aisle right here, for sheep to go through and the shepherd and for traffic to pass through between the fields. And so it was very important that the sheep followed right behind the shepherd because if the sheep got off into the fields and began to damage the farmer's crops, the shepherd was liable for the damage that the sheep caused to the fields. 
Now, this will all tie in in a few minutes in what, in what we're talking about here. But we need to understand what it's like to be a shepherd, to understand what David is talking about. Hallelujah. Look at verse 1. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Now, the first thing I get out of that, the Lord is my shepherd. M-Y, he's mine. And again, we look out into a flock of sheep, we see a bunch of sheep. We look out and see a bunch of cows, we see a bunch of cows. But David said, he's my shepherd, he knows me by name. He is mine. And I am his. And you know, many people would come into this room tonight and they would see just a bunch of people sitting in pews. But when the Father, and when our shepherd looks down, he doesn't see a bunch of people. He doesn't see, he doesn't see just a room full of people. He sees each individual unique creation that he has made in us. And that he sees individuals. He doesn't see a bunch of people. And when, when, and when you go to him with your needs, know this, that he knows you because you are a unique creation in his sight. And that he is able to call you by name. And you are very special in his sight. You are one of a kind. And when I say that, my wife says, Hallelujah. But you are one of a kind to him. You are very unique to him. You are very special to him. You are very precious to him as one of his sheep. Now, you may, you may not be as good looking as Pastor Pickens. You may not be as talented as his wife. You may not be, uh, have the charisma that some other do. You might not have the beautiful personality. You might not live in a nice house or whatever. But that makes no difference. The foundational level is as if you know Jesus Christ. And because you know him, you're one of his sons or one of his daughters. And because of that, you're in his sheepfold, and he loves you like he loves every one of us. And he's very concerned for your needs. And that's what David says, I shall not want. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He is totally dependent upon the shepherd is what he's saying. The sheep is... The sheep's total existence is upon the shepherd. There is no shepherd they can go to because we know uh, that in sheep and shepherd relationships that the sheep will not follow the voice of a stranger. That they only will follow the voice of the shepherd. And he calleth his sheep by name. He leads them wherever he wants them to go. And, and they have nobody else they can go to except their shepherd. And so David is saying, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He is entirely, completely dependent upon and satisfied in his shepherd. And his shepherd is a very powerful shepherd. Now we have a problem here. When we look at David's life in the natural, he didn't have a three-bedroom house or a four-bedroom house. He didn't have two cars. He didn't have a job bringing in 50000 a year. He didn't have any of those things. He lived out in the fields under the stars. And so, those of positive confession would say he'd had a, he had a problem with his confession. He'd say, brother, if you really knew God, you'd be living in divine prosperity. And David wasn't, so David wasn't talking about material things, was he? He says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He was not talking about material things. He was talking about the needs of his soul. The needs of his soul. The needs of his spirit. I shall not want. Paul says, whether I'm rich or poor doesn't make any difference. I'm content in him. That has nothing to do with it, whether I'm rich or poor. And so David was not return, referring to material things, but... To, but he was referring to the needs of his soul and that God's able to provide for anything that he would have need of. Anything, whether it be a house or whether it be a car, whether it be a job or, or whether it be finances or whatever. He says, I shall not want. If I come to a place of need, the shepherd will provide. It's simple as that. I don't look to myself. I don't look to friends. I look to him. He is my shepherd. He is my provider. He knows my needs. He's concerned. He loves me. He knows me by name. And he will provide when I have need. That's it. Can you say amen? He says in the next verse, He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. What's he say? Sheep are very timid, skittish animal. 
And for them to lie down is something remarkable. If you can get sheep to a place of so much contentment and so much at ease because they're a very nervous animal, if you can get them to a place where they lay down, it's a great accomplishment. And there's four things that keep sheep from lying down in green pastures as I look at this. Number one, fear. Because they have no defenses. All I can do is run from predators. Number two is friction in the sheepfold. You'll like that one. Friction in the sheepfold. Hunger. They won't lay down as long as they're hungry. They'll keep continuing to graze. And four is pests, things that bug them. Hallelujah. Fear, frictions, hunger, and pests. Keep sheep from lying down in green pasture. And again, you have to understand that sheep is a very nervous animal. And so David was saying, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He'll provide everything that I have need of. And so I have no reason to fear anything. My existence is in him. Hallelujah. My existence is in him. And so I have no reason to fear and be afraid of predators. And you know, can't help but meddle. In recent years, we were looking for demons behind every bush. And, and I've been involved in counseling situations with young people where they were trying to cast demons out of coke machines and, because it took their money. <laughs> but you know, the Bible tells us that when Lucifer fell, one third of the angels fell with him in demonic spirits that we know him today. But that left two-thirds in heaven, folks. So that makes it two to one. Two good ones against one bad one. Hallelujah. So I have no reason to fear, for the Lord is my shepherd. He is going to take care of any attacking force or predator that would come against me. He is mine. I am his. He provides. He takes care of me. That's all there is to it. And I'll keep repeating that until it... And I'll see your face light up in a minute, and the Spirit will make that a reality to you and a revelation. And, <clears throat> glory to God, here's the good one. Sheep will not lie down in green pastures when there is friction in the sheepfold. Now, if you ever raise cow, cattle, they call it a budding order. If you ever raise chickens, they call it a pecking order. Or pardon me, when you raise cattle, it's called a horning order. When you raise chickens, it's called a pecking order. And when you raise sheep, it's called a budding order. And all it's talking about is who's going to be big cheese. Who's going to be number one? And so the cattle with the longest and sharpest horns uh, comes against his opponent and knocks them out in a battle, and he's it. The, picket, the, the chickens, the pickings, the chickens. <laughs> My wife didn't fall out in the spirit. She passed out. <laughs> With embarrassment. I won't be speaking Tuesday night, folks. <laughs> Glory to God. <laughs> yes, the chickens start out peck one another. They <laughs> I'm glad we prayed. <laughs> well, glory. But anytime there's friction in the sheepfold, and whenever there's a, a battle going on, and these two sheep are working on that budding order, trying to figure out who's going to be top ram, they call it, and, and, and head ram the sheep will not lie down because again the, the anxiety over the situation the nervousness of the situation just scatters them and that has a very real application to churches today speaking the body of Christ that whenever there is rivalry going on whenever there is tension within the sheepfold many of the sheep get scared and just scatter many of the sheep just Get word over the situation and scatter. 
and it's hard for them to become content and to lay down and enjoy the rest there and enjoy the place that God has provided for them to be fed and to be satisfied in Him. And so they scatter. And another idea here is that the sheep will not lie down in green pastures as long as they're hungry. And the shepherd just continually takes them to a place of feeding. And the Lord desires today to feed you upon His Word, upon His Spirit. He desires to make your soul fat, the Old Testament tells us, in Him. Not that we would be a generation of blessing seekers. Bless me, bless me, bless me, bless me. God blesses, blesses you so you can be a blessing. That's the purpose of Him providing for you. So you can be a testimony. For you are a chosen generation. A holy priesthood, a, royal, a holy nation. That you should show forth the praises of Him. That's the whole purpose of it. That you would show forth His praises. The sheep will not lie down in green pastures when there's pests. Because insects will get around the sheep's eyes. And it will block their vision and cause infection in their eyes where they cannot see. And it's important that they see. Because they have to follow the shepherd. And there are many circumstances that come into our life. Things that bug us as his sheep. That hinder our vision. Where we see this problem right here. And Satan comes along and magnifies the problem where we can't see anything but that. And we can't see the shepherd and his leadership in that. And so it's something that bug us and Satan uses to magnify us and really depress us and, and begin to doubt God. But what the shepherd does is he comes along with oil and he anoints the eyes of the sheep that heals the, in, that heals the, the infection and also um, it is like a repellent to the insects. And that's what David talks about when he says he anointeth my head with oil, my cup runneth over. He's not talking about a 16-ounce tumbler. He's talking about the cavity of the eye. And what the Lord wants to do to you today and in any situation that you're in tonight where an impossible circumstance has come around you, an avalanche of life has just buried you and all you see is this problem. And let me tell you, friends, I've been there the last few months. I've been there. So when I'm preaching to you tonight, I just didn't hear somewhere and, and recite it. I've been there. I've had to walk this out. And you're in a circumstance, you see that problem before you. The Lord wants to anoint your eyes with the Holy Spirit so you can see the shepherd. Because he's the one that says, you shall not want when you're dependent upon me. I'll provide your every need. Hallelujah. The pasture here in the verses represents the word of God to me. And as we feed upon the word, he strengthens us and he makes our soul fat. And then it talks about he leaves me beside the quiet waters. And the water there represents the Holy Spirit to me. Because it's the Holy Spirit that really gives life to the word. Because as we read the word, it's like any other book we'd read, except not for the fact of the Holy Spirit that gives it life. That's why Paul said, the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. And so as we read the word, we read the letter, it, the Holy Spirit gives life to it. And that is when we're reading the Bible sometimes in our personal devotion and it seems like a verse just jumps off the, off the page and leaps in our spirit and says, hey, that's from you. Or as you're walking along, meditating on a verse and all of a sudden it just, it just bursts with life in your spirit and it feeds you at that moment and it gives you the direction you need right then. That is the Holy Spirit giving life to His Word. And He wants us to uh, partake of His Word Jeremiah, I believe was, was it says, and we sing the chorus, Thy words were found, and I ate them, and they became to me an utter joy. Thy words were found, and I ate them. I took them in, and they became joy to my spirit. And see, David says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. And the world would offer you today, and especially young people, Satan offers many vices and many wares and many synthetic substitutes. He offers to quench that hunger and quench that uh, and satisfy that thirst, but they only do it temporarily. Any he, all these substitutes that he offers only satisfies us temporarily. It, it is the Word of God and the Holy Spirit of God that satisfies our soul completely and our spirit in Him, and it is only He that feeds us. 
on a day-by-day -day basis, and, and it's not a high that wears off. It's a joy that takes me through any situation. Because, you see, the world substitutes all for happiness temporarily. But the Word of God and the Holy Spirit offer me joy. And there's a difference. Happiness is based on events. I get a check back from the IRS for $580. That makes me happy. Except for the fact that Barb's already spent it. That makes me happy. But God gives me joy in any circumstance I go through. That no matter what happens to me, I can rejoice in the fact that He is my shepherd, I am His sheep, no, and, if it, and He'll take care of every problem and every need that I have. And I, every time I say something like this to my mother, she says, well, we've got to do our part. I just have a hard time finding that in the Word. We do our part by being obedient to His Word and trusting God. And David had to tell himself in Psalm 62 about 15 times, wait on God, David. Wait, soul, on God. Because, you see, God wants to do something, make the impossible possible so He can receive glory. He wants to work out the situation in your life so you can give a testimony of praise to Him and put that testimony in your mouth. Not that you can work it out and say, well, bless God, I did it. He does not get any glory out of that. It only puffs up. Hallelujah. I want to skip. It says, He restoreth my soul. He restoreth my soul. Well, maybe I shouldn't. He restores my soul. The idea here is, if you recall in one of Jesus' parables, he talked about the hundred sheep that the shepherd had and 99 came in and one was missing. So he put the 99 in the sheepfold, which is a three-sided enclosure, and he went out to find the last one that was missing, the one who strayed. And an interesting idea, in fact, here about sheep is that whenever they get up on their back and off of their feet, they can lay down, but if they roll over on their back, they can't get back up. It's impossible. It's impossible for them to get back up. And so the idea David is saying here, and it's called cast a cast sheep. And the idea here David is communicating is, is that the shepherd goes out, finds the sheep, and restores it by setting it right back up on its feet and says okay follow me and don't stray away so far that is the idea and and many times there are those sheep who stray away from the shepherd habitually they know what the shepherd wants the shepherd makes a plain path for them but they insist on going their own way and the shepherd has a unique way of disciplining those sheep. Because again, because of the, the small path that they have to trod or go through whenever they're going through agricultural areas, it's important that they follow him. The shepherd will take the sheep that's continued disobedience aside and will break its leg. Will take its leg and break it as a discipline. And then in compassion, he will mend the sheep's leg. He will set it. And then, because they have to continue to keep moving, because from pasture to pasture, he'll take the sheep, and he'll put the sheep over his shoulders and carry it until the leg heals. And you've all seen the picture of Jesus, the good shepherd, carrying the sheep on his shoulders. That is the idea taking place. He's carrying a sheep, he's had a discipline. He's carrying a sheep, he had a discipline. And, and so many of us, the Lord through discipline, wants to restore us if we'll receive it. So many of us stray away time and time again. If you receive the discipline of the Lord, it hurts. But it brings restoration. And many of you, at the same time, He wants to restore you physically, emotionally, spiritually. Many of you, in, in past times, maybe you spent your life in the, in, the, in the cares of the world, in the alcohol, in the drugs, in the sexual immorality, you spent your body on those things. Or... God wants to restore you physically. He wants to bring restoration in your life. Restore you completely. He wants to, for those emotionally, He wants to restore your emotions. For those who have gone to, through the tragedy of divorce, He wants to restore you. He wants to heal. 
bring healing to your, to your emotions. And those of you who are disobedient, you've gone your own way. He wants to restore you spiritually. And I know what it is as a teenager to go to a chef, go to an altar 25 times on a Sunday night and recommit my life to the Lord only to find out on Monday I just couldn't make it and give it up. And I know what it is as a young teenager to be preached at if you commit one sin, God doesn't love you anymore. And you backslidden. And that's just wrong teaching, folks. It has a hard time coming in, in, in agreement with the Word as I read it, as I understand it, and revealed to me by the Holy Spirit. God stands ready to restore and to forgive if you will only turn to Him in obedience and ask for His forgiveness and be willing to repent, which means to turn from your old life to Him. For the Christian life is not hard, it's impossible. <clears throat> the Christian life is not hard, it's impossible. It's impossible for you to live a holy life because we are sinful. But never underestimate the ability and the power of the Holy Spirit to move in your life. And as Paul said it to the Ephesians, he's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. And we usually stop right there, but the next phrase says, according to the power that works in us. According to the power that works in us. And the Lord wants to restore you this evening. That, this is for someone right now. The Lord wants to restore you wherever you have need tonight. He says, He leads me in the path of righteousness for His name's sake. He leads me in the path of righteousness for His name's sake. No one can show you what true righteousness is except the shepherd. Now, on one end of spiritual circles today, we have those that say, don't do this, don't do this, and don't do this. And you'll be holy. And then we have those, and you'll be righteous. And those on this side, well, bless God, you're saved and do anything you want to. You're saved, that's it. And we're looking for the middle. Over here, these folks are saying, don't spit, don't chew, and don't go around with those that do. And over here, these are saying, well, you're saved, that's it. You've made a commitment to Jesus, you're saved no matter what you do. You can't lose your salvation. Two extremes. But there's only one person that can show you what true righteousness is, and that is Jesus Christ, the Good Shepherd. As you read His Word and His Holy Spirit teaches you, only He can show you what true righteousness is. And He leads you in the path, He'll lead you down a path to make you righteous. And again, only the Holy Spirit working in your life through His Word, and through Jesus Christ speaking to you, can you understand what true righteousness is? Because we preach principles from this pulpit. But only the Holy Spirit knows your life. And only the Holy Spirit knows where you have need to change. And He comes to you, and not point His finger at you, condemning you for what you are, but He convicts you in compassion. Satan condemns you. He, Satan comes to me and tells me how worth, unworthy I am, how, how guilty I should be, how many sins I've committed in the past, what I'm doing wrong, what I've done wrong, and he tries to point a finger because he's accused of the brethren. But the Holy Spirit comes to me in a quiet, loving, soft voice. It says, my son, I love you. And I desire change in you. And I'll give you the power to be able to do it if you'll be obedient and you'll be willing Hallelujah. But you see, God loves fat people. God loves fat people. People that are faithful, people that are available, and people that are teachable. Some of you thought you were off the hook. Hallelujah. I don't want to skip verse 4. It's my favorite. Oh, pardon me. Yeah, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. The idea here is, is the shepherd in the summer when it got hotter and hotter and hotter, the better pasture was up in the mountains. But to get to the mountains, the shepherd had to go through the valleys. And these were deep, treacherous ravines sometimes, and the predators would, uh, the mountain lions and the cougars and so forth, would get up on the sides of the valley and wait for the sheep to come through so they could pounce on them and devour them. And, 
And we know and we've all identified with this walking through the valley of the shadow of death. And that's what he's talking about. The sheep going through a valley when at any moment a mountain lion could lurk, lurking behind a rock could leap on them and kill the sheep. The valley of the shadow of death. And all of us have been there and those crises experienced in our lives. And we try to do everything that we know how to do. But ultimately, we must turn to God and say, God, I am yours. Your reputation is at stake here. For you are my shepherd. You provide everything that I have need. I shall not want. And David said, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'm not going to fear any evil. I'm not going to worry about the predators. And, and I thought about it. How can David say that so assuredly? How can David say that so confidently? How can he be so cocky to say that? The next few words tell you. For thou art with me. For thou, O God, art with me. And I pray to the Lord for Hebrews 13, 8. It says that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And he is with you right now. He is with you in this hour. No matter whether you're feeling good or feeling bad, no matter whether you're experiencing a, a hallelujah breakdown, as they used to call it, or whether you're going through a real trial in your life right now, whether you're walking through a crisis experience, God is with you. And so you have no reason to fear evil. Now, David won some guy living off, some evangelist somewhere living off selling tapes and sending magazines out. David experienced what he was talking about. He knew what it was to walk through the valley of the shadow of death. He told Saul, I've killed the lion and I've killed the bear to protect the sheep. And he came down into a valley one day and met a ten-foot giant named Goliath. And he looked at him, little old scrawny dude, and said, looked at that Goliath and says, Who are you that you would taunt the armies of the living God? I like that. And how can he be so cocky? He said that. For thou art with me. Thou art with me. He knew what it was to be a, have a tax on his life by Saul trying to kill him. He knew what it was to have a rebellious son come against him and try to kill him and take his kingdom. He knew what it was to fight the Philistines and, and at any moment could be killed. David knew about the crisis experience of life. He knew about the battle of the shadow of death. He was very acquainted with it. He'd been there many times. And he says, but I'll fear no evil. For God is with me. For thou art with me. Hallelujah. Look to verse 6. If you would. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I'm going to dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I'm glad he ended it that way. I'm glad he ended it that way. And the whole, if you look back to verse 1, it talks about how great the shepherd is. And then the next four, or the next five verses, all it talks about is the benefits of the sheep. And what they get out of the deal. But he ends it, goodness, God's goodness and God's mercy are going to follow me all the days of my life. Now, that's talking about an earthly realm right here and now. All the days of my life, God's goodness and God's mercy is going to be shown to me. Why? Because he said, the Lord is my shepherd. Because the Lord is my shepherd, his goodness and his mercy are going to follow me all the days of my life. And then it talks about a different realm. It talks about an eternal realm. And I will dwell in the presence of the house, the abiding place of the Lord forever. He's going to follow me all the days of my life now, and I'll be with him forever. Hallelujah. I'm glad he ended that way. But David had said, the Lord is my shepherd, meaning that he is my boss, meaning that I am completely sold out to doing his will. I am completely sold out to him as guide over my life. I have no will of my own. And you know... What David was saying, and what we need to get the idea here is that we should be a room full of dead people. We should be a room full of dead people. Do you get what I mean? Because March 1st, 1970, Dave Rutledge yielded his life to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And his desires, his will, his plans, they all died that day. And whenever you gave your life to Christ, you did not give your life to Christ to get what you could get from Him. You gave your life to Him simply as Lord, whatever that entails. Whatever He does with your life makes no more difference to you for you've died. 
And if you keep that mentality that I have died, Jesus is my guide, He is my boss. I check in and out with Him. And He gives me instructions and I do them. When you make that your claim, sold out completely and totally to the will of God, you know what it is to say, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And yea, though I go through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil for the shepherd's there. The shepherd's there. And there's nothing that comes to sheep like the presence of the shepherd. And he's here with you right now. There's three things about verse number six that you look at. Number one, man always honors and highlights the famous and forgets them. When I was 16 years old, everybody talked about Bart Starr and the Green Bay Packers. But Bart Starr's kind of faded off the scene these days, and nobody spends too much time talking about Bart Starr when they refer to football. When I was 14 years old, the words on every teenager's lips were the Beatles, the Beatles, the Beatles, the Beatles. Everybody was buying Beatle wigs, Beatle boots, and everybody had their name, uh, their favorite Beatle picked out, and they were uh, swoon when they hear the records, the girls would. And everybody talked about the Beatles, but nobody talks about the Beatles anymore. Because you see, man honors and highlights the famous, and he forgets them. But God honors the unknown and the insignificant and never forgets them. David says, I'm going to dwell in the house of the Lord forever. He'll never forget me because I'll be with him forever. And you know, man rewards today for achievements that are accomplished. Someone wins a 100-yard dash, we give him a plaque or trophy. If someone makes it in the... In the Olympics, we give them a gold medal. If you are the greatest insurance salesman in your office, they give you a plaque with your name on it in the year. Man rewards now for accomplishments, but God rewards later. God rewards later. And this is for those of you that think that there are unknown saints in the room or something. And those of you that have served in a teaching capacity, maybe as a Sunday school teacher, or maybe you've been an usher, and it's been a long time since the pastor came and told you what a good job you're doing. Or maybe it's been a long time since somebody told you how much they appreciated your ministry in the body. We don't get our rewards here. We get them there. Like the pastor said, it was Chuck Swindoll that said it. He told the story about a missionary couple who after 40 years of service on a European field, they were coming home on a boat, and on that boat with them was the Queen of England. And so they got to New York City, and they docked there. Let me come down here right get close. They docked there in the harbor of New York City. And lo and behold, here's the, here's the mayor of New York City, the vice president of the United States, these college bands, Thousands and thousands of people all there to greet the Queen of England. And here she came out in her garments and all the, the court that was with her and all the pomp and ceremony that accompanied it. And all the people cheered and they threw streamers and the whole bit and the band played and the, and the mayor gave her the key to the city and those kind of things. And, and the little old missionary couple stepped off the boat and looked at all the fanfare that was going on for this queen the man looked at his wife and says, Honey, we served the Lord for 40 years on a foreign field. And there's not even one person here to meet us at the dock. And here this woman by birth is the queen of England. Not by anything she accomplished, but just by birth. And to a certain family, she's a queen. And look at everyone here to meet her. And his wife looked at him with tears in her eyes and says, Honey, we're not home yet. But we're not home yet. Hallelujah. Let's stand together. Hallelujah. Let's look back at what we've talked about tonight. The Lord is my shepherd. He knows you individually. He wants to lead you as an individual. And He loves you because you're a unique creation. Remember... Fear, friction, hunger, and pests keep sheep from lying down in green pastures. And it's the pasture that's the Word, and it's the water that's the Holy Spirit that gives us life and makes our soul fat. 
in him. And only he can teach us what true righteousness is and lead us down the path of righteousness. Only the shepherd. And remember this, that we're not home yet. That we're not home yet. Hallelujah. We're not home yet. Won't that be a great day? Hallelujah. That'll be such a great day. Praise the Lord. Barb, would you come and sing? Hallelujah. Father, we praise you for the ministry of your word. Now we commit it to the Holy Spirit. And God, maybe there's someone here that doesn't know Jesus Christ as their shepherd. Boss of their life. I ask in Jesus' name right now that your Holy Spirit would minister to them in love and say, it's the greatest life in the world. Don't miss it. The benefits that are ours now and the, the, and the knowledge that we'll be with Him forever. Hallelujah. Holy Spirit, just speak to that heart right now in Jesus' name. It's only you can do. We can do a lot of things. We can preach a lot of sermons, but your Holy Spirit can do more in two seconds in a person's heart than, than a million sermons could ever do. So Holy Spirit, we realize your power and your ability. And we ask you to do a work right now in Jesus' name. Father, maybe there's those here tonight that need restoration. In the name of Jesus, restore them, Father. Whatever the emotional hurt is, whatever the, the, the struggle they've been through, restore them, Father, I pray in Jesus' name. Father, those that are straying away from you, discipline them. Discipline them, I pray in Jesus' name. And maybe they receive it gladly. Knowing that you care is the reason you discipline Father, for those that are here, Father, that haven't been told that they've been appreciated in a long time, press upon them the fact that there are unknown, no unknown saints in the kingdom of God and that we're not home yet. That your rewards come when we get there. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Holy Spirit move right now in Jesus' name. Jesus' name. Hallelujah.
praise the name of the Lord. Just wait a minute before the Lord. It's so good to be in the presence of the Lord.